Hello, it's high noon. Please take a seat. All right, everybody, it's high noon. We are beginning. Thank you. Um, welcome to LA2M. Thanks for being here. My name is Derek Maravon. I run a company called Ingenix Digital Marketing in town and uh, helped start LA2M. It's been like eight years now we've been doing this. So thank you. Some of you have been here the whole eight years. Thanks for, uh, it's amazing we're still here. But we are monthly, we're a monthly program. We meet on Wednesdays. We bring in brilliant speakers. It's all about marketing education. And LA2M is a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, so, I don't know, we basically provide this educational programming for you. Um, we used to be weekly, so now we're monthly. But uh, anyways, uh, anyone here for your very first LA2M? Any first timers? Okay. Welcome, welcome new people. Uh, we, just to give you an idea of format, our speaker will come on in a couple minutes, um, speak for approximately 30 to 40 minutes, there may be some time for Q&A. At 12.45, you will get a chance to introduce yourselves. So if you want to tell us about your business, uh, you can do that. And then we always finish by 1 o'clock. So you'll be out of here by 1 no matter what. Um, if you want food, uh, just order from the servers and they'll bring it out to you. They have really good food here and drinks and then just pay your bill there. Um, LA2M, as I said, is a 501c3. So we are uh, sponsors, help us, sponsors, and Tax Coast Solutions. Today we have Milena Cummings, who is, uh, I guess, the founder of TaxCo or something. She's important, but uh, Milena is, uh, they do great CPA work and tax. Milena, you want to say a few words about your company? Sure. Oh, sure. Hello, everybody. Um, we are a, a CPA firm that is geared towards small businesses. So the businesses that you see on Main Street are really the ones that we like to deal with, as well as personal taxes as well. Um, very always interested in the marketing and of things, so I'm happy to sponsor. Thank you very much. And we have, I guess, other sponsors too, you could say. So Roger Rail um, does our video production, does great work. This, this uh, LA Twin live streams, so people watch it from all over the world. Carter Sherline takes photography for us, which is great. Uh, again, volunteer. Uh, Stacy Collick in the back from Dollar Bill Printing is our treasurer and she helps out a ton. Um, so we're volunteer, I mean I volunteer. So it's a great organization. If more people want to volunteer and help out, there's a couple people checking in this morning. You can always volunteer to check in or we need more uh, board members and we may be looking to grow the board. Also one thing this year, we're probably going to continue through the summer. Okay, so we have speakers lined up all the way through August and we figure since we're doing it once a month, why not? If you're in town, come to LA2M. Um, the dates is pretty much the second Wednesday of the month, usually, uh, except when there's like art fair or something. So in that case, I need somebody to cover for video a couple months. Okay, so Roger's, Roger likes to go up north. Yeah. Yeah, he, he goes to Camp Michigan and does things like that. So we may need someone to cover the video. So if you're a video person, uh, you can do that. Um, I guess that's it. That's kind of enough announcements. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about our speaker. Oh, Jim Musial just texted me, said it's not live streaming. Oh. I don't know. Don't get your text while you're doing introductions. But our, <laughs> Jim is usually here, he's homesick, so let's pray for a speedy recovery for Jim Musial. If you see that, Jim. But um, he's trying to watch from home. So our speaker today is a longtime friend of mine, Chad Wiebesek, who he speak, he's spoken here before, it's been a while. But he was previously with the uh, MEDC Pure Michigan, all that great work up there as director of digital. He is now back in Ann Arbor, which is great because he commuted to Lansing, which was a noble effort. And um, I'm a Spartan, so I'm okay with commuting to Lansing. That's great, but we're glad he's back. And he's going to be working with Visit Ann Arbor, uh, the Ann Arbor Convention Visitors Bureau, Ypsilanti Convention Visitors Bureau, and uh, just a great, great guy. Most of you probably know him. Chad Wiebesek, so anyways, he's going to talk today about social media business blunders that can get you fired, which I certainly want to learn about. So without further ado, let's give Chad Wiebesek a warm round of applause and welcome him to Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, good to see you. Thanks for having me here today. Can you hear me on the, uh, the speaker? Uh, the audio's coming through okay? Yes. 
Great. I thought it'd be fun uh, today to take you on a journey, a journey, and uh, share some stories uh, with you of businesses that have made big bloopers using social media. And these will be some stories just ripped from the headlines of stories from today and stories from yesterday. Some big blunders, big and small, and some lessons uh, learned along the way. And I thought it'd be fun to actually begin our time uh, together to share a, a story uh, during my time at Pure Michigan. Um, maybe one of the small blunders, or big blunders, depending on how you look at it, that we made. So this was the uh, second day on the job. I was newly hired. And the second worst day of my professional career was my second day in the job. <laughs> How's that for starters? And uh, we published a story of a famous uh, Hollywood actress. I'm going to step back so that we can still see me on the live screen. Uh, so we published a story of a famous Hollywood actress that flew all the way from Hollywood, California to Ann Arbor, Michigan. And during her time here, she went to all the best restaurants and all the art galleries, and she had a great time, went to the coffee shops, and she flew back from Ann Arbor, back to California, and she published a story on her blog about her great time here in Ann Arbor. She's a famous Hollywood actress. And we published this story on the Pure Michigan Facebook page. What could go so wrong? What could be so bad about that? Well, I'll tell you who this individual was. It boils down to knowing your audience because uh, this famous Hollywood actress was Jane Fonda. Who here knows who Jane Fonda is? Okay. Do we know Jane Fonda as an actress or more as a uh, Vietnam War protester? It's kind of a, a split mix, right? Um, anyone likely over the age of maybe 40 or, or so might know Jane Fonda less for her, uh, being a Hollywood actress and more of uh, being an anti-Vietnam War protester. She was a uh, politically polarizing figure in the 70s. Well, the fact is, the Pure Michigan Facebook page, the average age of the fan, are women over the age of 50, roughly. So they know Jane Fonda less for being an actress and more for being a, a war protester. So this one Facebook post caused people to unlike the page more than any other post uh, during that time and in the years up to the Facebook page. People were tagging their friends and family saying things like, I'm going to read this to you. Wow, not a great idea up here in Michigan to post this page. People were tagging their friends and family saying you have to defund Pure Michigan for this political statement. And this was my second day on the job. My boss hired me to get fans, not lose fans. So what do you think I'm thinking? When my boss and my boss's boss and my boss's boss's boss is all looking at me, Chad, what do we do? What do we do? That's the question, what do we do? <coughs> There's likely any number of things we could have done. Any suggestions here from the group of what you think we should have done? People are, and keep in mind, people are tagging their friends and family, telling them to defund Pure Michigan and unlike the Facebook page. What do we do? Any suggestions here? Apologize. Apologize. There's any number of things we could have done. One is just apologize, right? Just, just be human and keep it simple. We're sorry. Let bygones be bygones. We make mistakes. That's one option. Another option is, well, let's just post something else quickly to the Facebook page and change the topic right? and make the mistake go away. Well, or we could start deleting comments, right? People were swearing at us. There's a lot of vulgarity. We could have deleted comments. There's probably half a dozen other things we could have done uh, with pros and cons to each of those scenarios along the way. So uh, this was her Facebook post uh, that, that she wrote that we published. So here's what we did. Sometimes in life, doing nothing is doing something, right? And in our case, because we have a brand that's as beloved as Pure Michigan, our fans, our biggest advocates came to our defense. When you, when you have a brand, a company that, that people love, your best customers, are so loyal with you that they come to your defense, that's what we did with Pure Michigan. We let our advocates support us. People said things like, so are these comments from everyone who has never regretted something they did when they were younger? Someone else said, Welcome to Michigan, Jane. Please ignore these few idiot remarks here. As they say, there are good and bad people everywhere. So you know what? We learned a valuable lesson. You have to know your audience. 
and in retrospect, we wouldn't have published something that would have been um, a polarizing issue for our fans who are typically women over the age of 50. I didn't get fired for this, not even close. But let's, uh, let's talk about some people that did get fired for some social media blunders. Some people get fired even before they begin their job. Isn't that crazy? So a teenager was so excited that she was getting a new job at a pizza restaurant, she tweeted, quote unquote, and we'll keep this PG-13. <laughs> Ew, I start this F-ass job tomorrow. Thumbs down, thumbs down, she tweeted that. Well, her supervisor, who was the pizza Rita manager, saw it and said, uh, no you don't start that F-A job today. I just fired you. Wow. <laughs> People get fired even before they can start a job. Sometimes, sometimes using emojis can get you fired. So the uh, Houston Rockets and the Mavericks were two, uh, and, uh, uh, basketball teams playing in a tournament. This was uh, not too long ago last year. And the uh, Houston Rockets uh, sent out a tweet. Shh, just close your eyes. It will all be over soon. What does this tweet even really mean? In kind of a, a metaphorical sense, you know, it, it look, looks like, uh, well, in a literal sense, it looks like the Rockets are going to kill the Mavericks with a gun that the Rockets are going to kill every single player on the Mavericks with a gun. That's a literal interpretation of it. But a, a kind of a non-literal interpretation of it is, uh, is that they're, they're going to knock their socks off and win. But some people thought that, shh, just close your eyes, it will all be over soon, is something that attackers say to their victims. So um, the Twitter sphere was up in arms with that, and uh, Chad Shanks got fired for that, for using emojis in an inappropriate way, and he sent an apology. He had had this job for five years, and had always been seen as an individual that kind of pushed the envelope for his organization, but his latest tweet crossed the line. So, the takeaway here is, in the heat of the moment, take time to think about how others are going to view your post. And here's another key takeaway, is check your work before you hit send. So uh, this year's Oscars, Total Beauty said to tweet that said, we had no idea Oprah was tatted. And we love it, Oscars. Um, that's not Oprah. <laughs> that's not Oprah. Wow. People on Twitter have a sense of humor. People reacted with mocking responses. People said things like, uh, Matthew McConaughey is looking good for the Oscars. <laughs> That's not Matthew McConaughey. And then people reacted with harsh criticism as well. People said, haven't you ever seen a black person? Oprah and Whoopi look nothing alike. And finally, Total Beauty apologizes. They uh, apologized for their error, and they ultimately donated $10,000 to a charity of choice for both Whoopi and Oprah. I think that's a good lesson we should all remember. If you're gonna make mistakes, own up to it, and be quick to apologize. Here's one of my favorite examples of what not to do with social media, is don't tweet and drive. Not only is it illegal, and get you fired, okay? Uh, a, an individual was driving uh, in Detroit, and he worked on the Chrysler Advertising uh, Agency campaign. He sends a tweet, that says, I find it ironic that Detroit is known as the Motor City, yet no one here knows how to effing drive. He spelled out the word effing. <laughs> <laughs> Keep this PG-13. And he sent this. He made a mistake, of course. He made many mistakes here. He intended to send this to his personal account, not to the Chrysler account, right? That was mistake number one. Probably the second mistake is, if I had an advertising agency that thought so little of my business that they had staff that sent out messages like this, even on their personal accounts, I would be pissed. So not only did this individual get fired from the advertising agency, Chrysler fired their advertising agency as well. Don't tweet and drive. <laughs> Also, don't automate your social media feeds. 
So the New England Patriots, to celebrate reaching one million followers on Twitter, it's a very, very monumental uh, moment for them, they uh, sent out a tweet and they invited their Twitter community to retweet their tweet for a chance to have your Twitter handle appear on the back of a New England Patriots jersey. It, it wasn't a real jersey, it was just a, an image of a jersey. Well, they weren't moderating their feed, so it didn't take long from some jerks on Twitter to create an account and have the New England Patriots tweet, I hate uh, the N-word. And so the New England Patriots sent a tweet that said, I hate the N-word. Thanks for helping us become the first NFL team with one million followers. And that was terrible. Of course, they apologized, and that's a good best practice. If you make a mistake, own up and apologize. And it was a regrettable tweet. The takeaway here is, you know, companies large and small make mistakes uh, every day, every week, every month, you know, throughout the year. You'll see organizations make mistakes like this, uh, big and small. Uh, using an automated tool like this doesn't cost a lot of money. Small companies use tools like this to automate feeds. If you automate feeds, you still have to have people on staff to manage the content and moderate the content. Even really smart, we've seen a lot of just dumb mistakes made by dumb people doing dumb things, but even smart people inadvertently make mistakes. Um, there was an individual, this was a couple years ago, uh, she was a public relations professional. Uh, her name was Justine Saka. She does this for a living, not making mistakes, but she does PR for a living. And she should have known better. She's a public relations professional, and she sent a tweet that was heard around the world. Her tweet as she boarded the plane from the US to Africa was this, quote unquote, I'll read it for you. I am going to Africa. I hope I don't get AIDS. Just kidding, I'm white. In one tweet, she insulted half the free world and even more people than that, in just one tweet. The thing was, she sent that tweet and then she was flying in the air for 14 hours. <laughs> and the hashtag, has just team landed yet, began trending worldwide. People were pissed. Uh, this one individual said, I don't think America has watched a landing this closely since Apollo 13 re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. Even Donald Trump got on in it, regardless if you are an advocate for him or not, he got in on it. He said, Justine, what the hell are you, do are you doing? You're fired. So by the time, by the time she landed 14 hours later in Africa, um, well, even brands got in on this. I, I thought GoGo, uh, of all the brands that kind of jumped in on this, I thought GoGo had the best tweet. They say, uh, the next time you plan to tweet something stupid before you take off, make sure you're on a go-go flight. <laughs> 14 hours later, she lands and the paparazzi was there waiting for her. And she got fired. She got fired. She later said uh, in a newspaper interview, you know, she lost her job, her reputation is destroyed, and she's not able to date anymore. <laughs> Thing is, she's not a bad person. She was just bad at using Twitter. You know, what she found was that when she was always kind of snarky and she made these snide comments like this, even on her own personal account, that she got more followers and more engagement. So she liked that type of engagement from her fans because she got more interaction and she got more followers that way. It was poor taste. In our businesses, let's not focus on getting more fans. Let's not focus on using gimmicks to get more followers. Let's focus on creating engaging content that inspires people to interact with our brands. Because here's, here's the reality. Here's a reason why not to focus on fans. Justine was focused on fans. She wanted to get more people to interact with our content. Here's a reason why not to do that if you need yet another reason. This happened to me. Um, there was a point in time when Pure Michigan uh, for many years, had more fans than any other state in the nation on Facebook. And we were proud of that fact, that, that Pure Michigan had more Facebook followers than any other state in the nation. We were proud of that. 
Uh, but there became a point in time when uh, that was no longer true, and I'll never forget that day. My <coughs> boss walks into my office, and no, this wasn't my second day in the job, it was a couple months later. But she walks into my office and she says, Chad, did you, did you hear the news? Did you see the news? And I said, what news? And she said, Pure Michigan no longer has the most Facebook fans. And I was devastated, because remember, I was hired to get fans, not lose fans, like the Jane Fonda uh, fiasco. And so I said, no, I didn't hear the news. Who, who has more Facebook fans? And she said, New York. So I went to my computer, I typed in New York's Facebook page, and sure enough, what I saw was that New York had a million followers, more than we did at the time. But what I saw next surprised me even more. That the average age of New York's Facebook fans were between the ages of 13 and 17 years of age. <coughs> they were teenagers. They didn't even have driver's licenses. So if New York's objective is to try to entice teenagers to use our hard-earned allowance money to hitchhike somehow to New York to vacation, <laughs> then they're doing the right job. Right? But if they're trying to entice real travelers to visit New York, then they're completely missed the mark. And so at the time, I was, I was surprised by that, but I went to another state that I also knew was doing a good job. I knew Michigan was, but I went to another state. I went to Florida. I went to Florida's Facebook page, and what I saw there was that their average age, their fan was between the ages of 35 and 54. So they have, that's the right target. They, they have money to spend. They don't have to spend allowance money. They have money to spend. So I took this information, went back to my boss, and I said, look, it's not quantity of followers on Facebook, it's quality of followers on Facebook. That matters. And so finally, if that wasn't enough, you can buy fans on Facebook. You can buy fans on Facebook. There's services out there. I'm not even going to pitch this. We can buy 100 Twitter followers for $9. So don't focus on the number of fans. Focus on uh, the quality of fans. Uh, U.S. Airways. This was probably, during my research, uh, putting together my presentation here, this is probably the most uh, graphic, egregious uh, business blunder that I saw any business made. The uh, U.S. Airways sent out a not safe for work graphic tweet. Uh, an individual, Ellie, was really upset that U.S. Airline, uh, that her flight was stranded on the airport runway uh, for well over an hour. So she sends it to uh, U.S. Airways, U.S. Airways gets it and sends a tweet back to Ellie. And here's what U.S. Airways says. We welcome feedback. If your travel is complete, you can detail it here for review and follow-up. I don't know if you can see this photograph. I don't even want to describe what this photograph is, but it's, uh, it's a highly pornographic image. What a huge mistake. If this wasn't a mistake enough, I think the biggest mistake is that U.S. Airways took over an hour to catch the tweet and apologize. They're a big organization. And the blunder there was that they were using a system to flag inappropriate content, but the same system they were using to flag inappropriate content inadvertently sent out the inappropriate content. Again, you don't have to be big, big business to make mistakes, you can be small businesses and make these common mistakes. The biggest lesson learned here was it took them an hour to catch the mistake and apologize. Here's a good best practice. Be timely and topical, but smart in the content that you share on social media. One of my favorite examples of organizations uh, that are sharing uh, real-time content in a timely and topical way, this was a few years ago. It's a good example uh, then as it is today. Uh, this was from Oreo Cookie. Uh, the Super Bowl lights went out a couple years ago, and <coughs> lights went out in the Super Bowl, and within 15 minutes, Oreo sends out a tweet. Do you remember seeing this uh, or hearing about this news? Oreo sends out a tweet uh, on Twitter that says, power out, no problem. You can still dunk in the dark. This was within 15 minutes of the lights going out. And this tweet got 15,000 retweets, 5,000 favorites, and they got thousands and thousands of new followers. And Ad Age Magazine, that year when they were doing the recap of the best Super Bowl commercials, the best Super Bowl commercials weren't on TV, according to Ad Age, it was this one right here. 
Oreo did a great job of, the, of being timely and topical. We had our own example of being timely and topical with real-time content marketing. This is one of my favorite stories uh, I like to share about Pure Michigan. Uh, this was a few winters ago. Uh, we reacted quickly to a rather obscure tweet that ultimately generated $17 million worth of PR buzz around the world. Uh, let me tell you the story. Uh, this was any regular winter. Uh, we were, I was, uh, me and our team were in the middle of winter, busy promoting all the great things we are to do in Michigan during the winter. Snowmobiling, climbing frozen waterfalls, skiing, and all that other stuff. Uh, on a given day, we get between 200 to maybe 400 tweets a day. One particular tweet came through our news feed and it caught my attention. Why? Because it came from an influencer, an advocate, one of our biggest customers. It came from the Hossam Mitten, which is a influential travel writer, blogger in Michigan. When your big customers tweet, when they talk to you, listen. So of the 300 tweets that come through on a daily basis, I saw this tweet. The awesome mitten says, I guess we should clarify. We think the only awesome mitten is Michigan. Apparently, Wisconsin thinks it's a mitten too. It was a cryptic tweet. I wasn't quite sure what it meant, but because it came from, from an influencer, a big customer, I clicked through on the link. And here's what we saw. But sure enough, Wisconsin was using a mitten. This is the Travel Wisconsin website. And there was a few tweets, a few comments. People said things like, it looks deformed to me. Somebody else said, you might need a few more fingers to fill out that Wisconsin mitten. And that was, the, that was in the afternoon. By the end of that day, one small newspaper out of Kalamazoo, the Kalamazoo Gazette, published one story. The story was titled, Wisconsin's use of a mitten to promote winter tourism is a real stretch. So let's pause here and, and take a, mo a moment uh, to reflect. So we're busy promoting winter travel and tourism. There was one tweet from the awesome mitten that generated 11 retweets that resulted in one newspaper story. So the question is, what do we do, if anything? And if we do something, why do we do it? If we do something, because we're busy promoting travel and tourism, that's our mission. If we do something, you know, the mitten thing, that's kind of off-brand, off-topic. It doesn't really ladder up to our business brand objectives. But we decided to do something, and we decided to do something big. We felt that there was a window of opportunity to shine the light on a time, a period of time, when travel typically is down. Our busy travel times are in the summer, not in the winter. And we thought that we could create a media frenzy by drawing even more attention to this. And so we did something bold. We launched a website. We launched a website called whoistherealmittenstate.com. And we took a poll to the people. We asked people in Wisconsin and Michigan who they think is the real mitten state. We never launched a website as fast as we launched this website. This is as real time as real time could be. We launched this website before noon that very next day. And we used WordPress. It was free. It didn't cost any money. You don't have to be a big organization to create websites. They're relatively low cost to do. And so we asked people, Who's the real mint state? We took the poll to the people. And we got a lot of user-generated content. And the content just kept on pouring out. <laughs> okay, it kept on coming. More and more and more content. And then finally, before the close of business that day, it broke statewide news. Uh, the Michigan Radio published a story, Michigan to Wisconsin hands off our mitten image. Well, Wisconsin uh, didn't take this line down. They fought back. And uh, their NFL team was undefeated, so they published on their Facebook page a uh, uh, rubbing, rubbing their mitten in our face, because uh, at the time, Detroit Lions uh, had lost <clears throat> every single game, and so they were undefeated, so they rubbed their mitten in our face. And we fought back to them. We took out some AdWords. It was a couple hundred dollars. It wasn't a lot of money, just a couple hundred dollars. We took out some AdWords. If you were anywhere in the state of Wisconsin or Michigan or in the U.S., and you did a search for Mitten State, or Mitten Debate, or Mitten Battle, or Michigan, or Wisconsin, who showed up first in Google? We did. And finally, it broke national news. And I thought about hundreds of stories. 
Chateau were published, this was my favorite from Gawker. It says, the dumbest war ever erupts online. States fighting over who looks most like a mitten. And there becomes a point in time when the stories start dying out and the media frenzy starts to kind of quiet down. This is uh, from Google Alerts here. And uh, you know, people's attention go elsewhere. And so the sensible answer for most businesses is let's just move on and get back to promoting winter travel and tourism. But again, we felt like we could take a risk, a calculated risk, and do something bold in a meaningful way to drive even more attention. So what we decided to do was to partner up with, with Wisconsin and do a charity drive. We shook pennies, so to speak, and invited Michigan and Wisconsin residents to donate their warm weather gear to their favorite local charity. And people loved this last uh, PR move. It, it prompted even more, uh, more conversations. And finally, it broke international news. And this time frame was about a week and a half, two weeks. It finally broke international news. So ultimately, over 300 stories were published. $17 million worth of PR buzz around the world. Why? Because we reacted quickly to a rather obscure tweet when there's more than 200 to 300 tweets a day that we see. And how much staff time did it take? A little bit of time and a few hundred dollars for those AdWords. <clears throat> there's a lot of companies that um, try to be timely and topical with news events, but miss the mark. So for instance, Kenneth Cole sent out a tweet that millions are in uproar in Cairo. Rumor is they heard about our new spring collection that's now available online. The problem is, when this tweet was sent, there was civil unrest in Cairo. And so they were in a very awkward way trying to insert themselves into a global conversation that completely backfired. Twitter was pissed about this. And Kenneth Cole didn't learn their lesson. A couple years later, they made the same mistake. They sent out a tweet that said, boots on the ground or not, let's not forget about sandals, pumps, and loafers. The phrase boots on the ground is a term that was used during the debate of the Iraq war. When is Kenneth Cole gonna learn their lesson? And here's another example, Epicurious. During the, uh, the Boston Marathon shooting uh, explosion, uh, Epicurious says, in honor of Boston and New England, may we suggest whole grain cranberry scones. What? Yeah, and then, 30 minutes later, they sent out another tweet that falls on uh, deaf ears. Boston, our hearts are with you. Here's a bowl of breakfast energy we could all use to start today. I don't even understand what they were trying to do. I mean, it sounds like they understand that there was an explosion, but they're trying to be sympathetic at the same time while they're pitching their product? How insane is that? Well, so Twitter was pissed, and Epicurious tried to do the right thing. They tried to apologize. They're sending individual tweets to all their followers apologizing, but the thing is, their tweets were disingenuous. They copied and pasted the same tweet to every single person. It was not heartfelt. It wasn't honest. It didn't feel real. They copied and pasted their apology to everyone. The lesson learned here is, look, if we make mistakes, let's own up to it, be quick to apologize, and don't ever, ever make light of serious situations. If there's some type of mass killing or national news, okay, we are always judicious in checking our scheduled tweets to make sure that we don't have something scheduled that day that might be offensive. So, for instance, if there was a mass shooting, we don't want to say, hey, you know, for, uh, for a filming event, we don't want to say, hey, come check out the live shoot of this filming event that's going to happen here. Phrases like shooting can be misinterpreted in different ways. So if you use a scheduler tool and there's a national event, just double check to see what you have scheduled. Here's what happens when social media managers inadvertently post the wrong account.
StubHub sends a tweet. Think F, it's Friday. Can't wait to get the hell. Don't, can't wait to get out of this stuff sucking hell hole. I couldn't understand if they were being real or this is deliberate or what they were trying to do here. This was just completely wrong. Was, was their account hacked? Was, was the manager just having a bad day? Gosh. And then um, the Red Cross, uh, you know, sometimes mistakes are, are honest, okay? And people send a tweet thinking they're tweeting on their uh, personal account. So uh, the Red Cross sends out a tweet. Ryan found two more four bottle packs of dogfish heads minus touch beer. When we drink, we do it right. Getting slizzard hashtag. Well, they're having a fun night. She was having a lot of fun, the, uh, the account manager, but she inadvertently posted this to the wrong account. But she handled it tactfully and with grace. She says, just moments later, we've deleted the rogue tweet, but rest assured the Red Cross is sober and we've confiscated the tweet, uh, the, the keys. Sometimes good humor tweet acknowledges the mistake. So have a sense of humor, be quick to apologize, don't copy and paste your tweets, and be, be genuine here. And as I mentioned, sometimes the way it's handled can redeem or far further condemn uh, your brand. So, um, so she was very quick at apologizing, and she had a good sense of, sense of humor about it. <laughs> Be careful who you put in charge is the lesson learned here. And have policies, uh, checks and balances in place. I'm going to share a story with you about having checks and balances and policies in place uh, in a few minutes. <laughs> Sometimes an account can get hacked. So the University of Michigan got hacked. This wasn't too long ago. The University of Michigan uh, sports page got hacked. The University of uh, Michigan's football page was posting relatively not safe for work images. Uh, Nikki Sundstrom, the University of Michigan social media director, did all the right stuff. Okay, she did all the right stuff. She alerted her audiences that the respective Facebook pages got hacked. She alerted their audiences through press releases, calling the media, posting to Twitter and their other social channels, doing all the right stuff. She kept her community in a loop every step of the way. This is a nightmare happening. She, this is a living nightmare for Nikki Sundstrom. So access got restored. Okay, they worked with Facebook and relatively quickly in Facebook's world, uh, they got access, but the problem was it got hacked again. What a nightmare. They got access restored, and then it got hacked again, a second time. The problem there was that um, the individual that uh, had admin access to the Facebook page, her login credentials were compromised. So even though Facebook reclaimed access to the admins, because a hacker had that admin's login credentials, they were able to hack in a second time. So once Nikki identified that, they changed passwords for all of their admins. Here's another example. And if you like that University of Michigan example, uh, Nikki Sundstrom has a great case study written up about uh, what happened, why it happened, and how their organization resolved that issue uh, during that 24-hour period of time. Uh, you can go to their um, University of Michigan social media uh, section website and download their case study uh, for free. Here's another example of a brand that got hacked besides University of Michigan. Burger King got hacked and in a comical way uh, masquerades as McDonald's. And the next day the same hackers break into uh, Jeep's Twitter account. These hackers are just having a field day during that time. But sometimes brands fake getting hacked. The hacking with University of Michigan was real, the hacking with McDonald's was real, and with Jeep that we just saw was real. But sometimes brands fake getting hacked. This could be a gimmick. And it's effective maybe if you use it once, but if you use it twice, okay, it falls flat. So Chipotle faked getting hacked. Uh, as a way to promote their new Chipotle sandwich. They were just posting a bunch of random gobbledygook, you know, over the period of a couple hours. And then they finally let on, towards the end of those couple hours, that uh, they were promoting a new sandwich. 
Some people thought it was funny, a lot of people thought it was offensive because it, it crossed the line of, of being a bit unprofessional and a bit disingenuous. So here's the lesson learned from, uh, from the last few examples is, having social media hacking policy in place for your organization. Just because you have strong passwords for your admins, that not, that's not enough. Social networks nowadays allow two-step authentication. Twitter has this, Facebook has this. So if you're an admin and you have a strong password and you're accessing Twitter or Facebook from another device or another location, you can have those platforms prompt you to verify your credentials. So have, have that in place. University of Michigan didn't, and now they do. And that's one of the lessons you'll learn from uh, Nikki Sundstrom's uh, social media policy. We, um, at, our, at my time at uh, Pure Michigan, we had three social media policies. We had one for how the community should engage with us, what they can and cannot do. We had a social media policy for how employees <coughs> should and should not use social media. And then we had a social media policy for the administrators. How the, how the administrators should use social media and how often they should post and uh, times that are appropriate for them to delete or not delete comments. So consider having three different social media policies. Research trending hashtags before you use them. This gets a lot of companies in hot water. So there was a company uh, that sent out a tweet during the school shooting in Colorado Aurora. Uh, they used the hashtag Aurora. Their tweet was, Aurora is trending, clearly about our Kim K-inspired Aurora dress. Shop. Very poor taste. Uh, DiGiorno's Pizza used the hashtag Why I Stayed. And during this time frame, Why I Stayed was a, um, a, a positive message for domestic abuse uh, victims. DiGiorno sent out a tweet, why I stayed, you had pizza. Very poor taste. And DiGiorno, to their credit, they quickly apologized. They did not read what the hashtag was about before posting. That was the issue. So if you're gonna talk about national events, do so in a way that's relevant, not awkward or insensitive, and if you're gonna use popular hashtags in your tweet, do your research first. Just because it's trending doesn't mean that it's something that you should or should not capitalize on is the takeaway here. Evaluate how new hashtags might be construed. So here's something funny. So this was a uh, British pop artist. She was a singer. And she was so happy about her upcoming, her upcoming um, uh, song, uh, album, release party, that she created a hashtag that she wanted people to promote and talk about. The hashtag that she created was Susan Album Party. Relatively, relatively straightforward, right? Um, clear and concise. The problem is it didn't take long for people in Twitter to reconfigure the hashtag Susan Album Party to Susan Anal Bum Party. <laughs> People on Twitter can be snarky. Yes, they can. Yeah, Susan Boyle's hashtag. Well, that's unfortunate. So here's some closing thoughts. We'll break for some Q&A. Here's some closing thoughts. If you mess up, own it. Say you're sorry and move on. Be genuine and be human. Don't copy and paste an apology and be effective. Okay, that's takeaway number one. Takeaway number two is please don't be a case study in my next presentation. <laughs> so here's my contact information. Uh, if you'd like to contact, uh, connect with me now or, or uh, later in the future. So thank you for your time and attention today. And we'll break for some, uh, from some Q&A. Thank you. Yeah, let's give them a big round of applause. Timing, Chad. It's 12:45. Great. Um, you can probably take one question. Does anyone have a burning question they really want to ask?
Hi, Chad. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I noticed in the uh, Patriots um, uh, example that you gave that they not only did they apologize, but they placed blame. They blamed it on some filter or something. What do you think about that? Should they have, should have just stopped it? I'm sorry that that happened instead of placing blame? I think that's a fair question. And I think oftentimes businesses, their need for reaction is to look to shift blame and, and, and um, assign blame to uh, some other organization look to shift blame. So I, my preference would be to accept full responsibility, not shift blame generally. However, in this specific case, I think it was the right thing to do, right? Because it was a technical misstep. Um, it was inadvertent. Uh, they, they took ownership, they apologized, and they all said, look, we well, you used some automated tool that uh, you know, got it through, and we weren't, we followed through the wheel, and we weren't paying attention. Um, so to your point, I think, on the whole, don't shift blame, but in this particular case, I think it is the right thing. We have one more back here. Uh, it's a little off topic from a blunder, per se, but um, uh, I have heard that if you are uh, trying to get people to review you on social media and things like that, that uh, first of all, sending links to several sites will cause all sites to downgrade uh, so that the, uh, the positive review has less impact. And also um, that if you send people a link and say, go here and review us, um, that uh, that will cause a downgrade in the uh, in the review too. I wondered if you had any comments about how to garner good reviews and make sure they stick. Yeah, I think your uh, approach has merit. If you're a small business, uh, a local business, and you want, uh, you know, in today's age, Yelp, TripAdvisor, those ratings carry more and more weight. Who do people trust nowadays? Right? They they they, don't, they certainly don't trust government. They trust. I don't trust companies. You think of Volkswagen, the Visa scandal, they don't trust companies. Um, they, they don't trust news media as an example. They trust people like themselves, their friends and family. That's why these third party ratings and review websites like Yelp and TripAdvisor carry so much weight. So to your point, I think your approach has merit to invite patrons to leave reviews, good or bad, about your business. I'm not too familiar with uh, your, your comment around. Um, Inviting guests to leave reviews on multiple websites and how that degrades, um, you know, the, the credibility. I'm not, you know, I'm not too familiar with that. I think just in my own experience, um, different people favor and use different review websites. Some people use Yelp more than TripAdvisor, right? So I, I think to that to that extent, if we just as a small business, if we can give people multiple options to leave multiple reviews at the place that's most convenient for them, I think would probably uh, be the most helpful. Are we out of time or do we have uh, time for more questions? If, if not, I will be here for at least a period of time, so I'd like to meet with you afterwards. Yeah, yeah let's give a round of applause. Uh, Chad, we uh, What a great talk. You know, you didn't just talk about blunders, you talked about some amazing successes too. It was nice to see that Mint example is just great. So, uh, okay. it's, yeah. it's one of my favorite stories. Though. Yeah, it's great. We're glad to have you back in town. Thanks, man. So we, we told him he doesn't have to wear a suit always now that he's back in the army. Yeah. Yeah. I dressed uh, down. I had a tuxedo early. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. I know, right? All right, that was a great, great talk. All right, so now we do introductions. Um, everyone gets to introduce themselves. This is your chance to introduce yourself to the group. Um, I'll, 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 I'll give you an example. So Derek Maribond, I run a company called Genex Digital Marketing. We help businesses with uh, lead generation, and we do a lot of inbound marketing to drive qualified traffic to their business. And then you pass the mic to your buddy, like Bud Gibson. I'm Bud Gibson, I created the Center for Digital Engagement at Eastern Michigan University. We train students in digital marketing. Uh, we're about to put on our summer clinic with Ann Arbor Spark uh, from June through August. And we also have, during the school year, a monthly speaker series. So look forward to seeing you there. I'm Roger Rail. I'm a venture catalyst. I help people and ideas get together and help a lot of networking groups. And tonight, uh, one of the groups that I started is Ann Arbor Video Interest Group, where George uh, Parasol is going to talk about um, different video hosting platforms, video content management systems. So if anybody's looking to, you know, how do you, how do you host your video in a way that it enhances your brand, this would be a good meeting to go to. It's at uh, it's at Carlisle's at 6.30 tonight. If you go to A2VIG, A2VIG.org, you can already see me through there.
the social media, the emails, and the website. I'm Barry Marshall, I'm the marketing manager at Rainbow, and Rainbow provides uh, rehab services for people with brain and spinal cord, spinal cord injuries. Can I have to go again? Yes. Sure. Yes, sir. My name is Joe, I'm actually working for the marketing company that is under the Tax Code Solution that sponsors us. We do anything from social media, to really outstanding, and, you know, get away with things. <laughs> Hi, my name is Janet Max. I run my own business in Kansas Endeavors. I do a lot of writing and content marketing. And I will be blogging today's uh, session. I curated it a bit so there or annotated a bit so there'll be links. For instance, I've got the link to the um, case study that Nikki Sunstrom did at uh, for U of M. Thanks. Uh, my name is Michael. This is Caroline and Amelia. We're here from Create My Tea. Um, we are a local uh, t-shirt company. Uh, we do both the printing and the design work, and we are in charge of all the marketing and sales. Hi, my name is Doug Selby. I am uh, with uh, Metal Arc Builders, which is a full-service design build company here in uh, Ann Arbor in southeastern Michigan area. Uh, we are uh, uh, specialized in uh, architectural work, uh, full service building, and um, also uh, do a, have a heavy emphasis on uh, green and sustainable building. I am Hannah McNaughton. I am the founder and CEO of Envision Marketing. We are a digital marketing agency um, located right across the street, actually. And I'm Sam, and I'm Hannah's content manager. Hello, I'm Sean Galanti from Dalton Copping. I'm here with Stacey. Uh, I've been helping with your pretty leads. I'm on Stacey. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Francis. <laughs> Hi, I'm Francis Allegra from Dale Marketing, the marketing solutions provider from design and print and specialty to direct mail services. Hi, my name is Lori Byron, and I run a company called Famous in Your Field. But I would like to tell all the ladies about WXW. It's Women's Exchange of Washtenaw. We have monthly events, and what I'd love to tell you about is October 20th, we have a day-long conference full of all kinds of great speakers and sessions. Cool. Um, I'm Melissa Fuentes. I'm the marketing director at the Ann Arbor Art Center, the go-to place for everything art-related here in Ann Arbor. Um, visit us at annarborsand.org and learn about everything that we do, art classes, exhibitions, an amazing um, retail shop, so visit us and come visit us. We have an amazing course of photography exhibition going on right now. Hi, I'm Bruce Kurtzels and I'm with the CBB. Very excited to work with Chad and all of my coworkers are here as well. I'm Martha Schmidt, I'm new to the CBB world, and I produce a video and photo content for the CBB. Hi, I'm Mary Rosicki, a business consultant in the area. Hi, I'm Bob O'Brien, uh, new business consulting in technology and technology products. The major key to your better future is you. How do you not major in minor things? Hi, I'm Dr. Thomas Blackwell of MPL and the Institute of Middle Prep for Preparation for Effective Living. We show people how to diversify their income for the future. Hello, I'm Thomas Esplanade. We work together uh, with and we've learned how to develop assets so that we don't have to spend the rest of our life uh, depending on a retirement check or a paycheck. So if you want to eventually get out of your job or have a plan B, uh, talk to us. Hi, I'm Sean Hickey. I'm with PWB Marketing Communications. We're a full service integrated marketing agency specializing in branding, demand generation, and storytelling. And happy to have one of our alums here speaking today. Hi, I'm Amy Weissman. I'm also with PWB. I do a lot of our day-to-day uh, -day client contact and a lot of our copywriting. Hi, I'm Laura Berarucci, also with the Washington County CDB, and I can echo my colleagues' thoughts, and we're thrilled to have Chad among us. I'm Krista Quinn, marketing manager for Motawi Tile Works. We are a small local company who produce 
handmade art tiles for the country and now the world, and the world is about to see us at the Volvic Championship as we are lucky enough to create the winner's trophy, and I'll be tweeting and Facebooking little images of the tile that will be presented to the champion, and I'll be doing that starting later this week and going up until the tournament. I am David Frank, I work for Armour Scientific. We're in the education market, specializing in physics, physical science, uh, products mostly. Hi there, my name is Robin Dryling. I'm an independent marketing consultant and writer focused on biotech businesses. Hi, I'm Sandra Stewart, I'm group sales manager with the Ann Arbor Marriott in Ypsilanti. We're currently undergoing some exciting renovations and we're just looking at how to market our property better. Hi, I'm Carrie Nelson. I'm also from the Ann Arbor Marriott. I handle business travel sales, so I can help companies uh, establish a preferred rate uh, for your company and for your clients. Um, as Sandra said, we are undergoing a really exciting renovation right now. So if you have any needs coming up for events, meetings, conferences, you just want to come and have lunch with us and play golf, <laughs> let us know. We'd love to show you um, the changes that we're making. It's really exciting. How are you doing? <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Andrew Fitness and I'm with Content Oral. Uh, we work with world-renowned publishers to provide amazing content for websites, any type of website that a company has or enterprise companies uh, need. And then also, uh, Content Oral just won Michigan's Most Innovative Business Award for 2016, so we're real excited. Uh, we're going a lot of great places, and we can't see what the future holds. I'm Karen Sharon, Frog Tech Studios, and a commercial editorial portrait photographer, which covers just about everything except for weddings. Sometimes a videographer, drone pilot, last couple of years. Um, if you're a runner, you've probably seen me probably looking something like that. Right up the face looks like lens. Or golf. Um, uh, I'm going to have to figure out how I'm going to be at Travis Point and also with. Ben Harbor for the seniors at the same time and working on <laughs> working on cloning things. Chad, we can say, and I, I just wanted to say thanks for your time uh, today. And uh, uh, now that I'm with the Washington County Convention Visitors Bureau, um, there are a lot of exciting restaurants and bars and events and festivals coming up uh, throughout our community here. Uh, if you're looking for something family friendly or, or some fun event to check out, uh, see me or one of our fine staff. Um, also, if you're with a local business that attracts travelers, uh, you're welcome to submit that uh, for free uh, to our website, visit annarbor.org uh, or our other uh, ipsilani.org uh, website. Uh, and also check out the events calendars uh, for both of those um, websites as well. So, thank you. Yeah, so there, there's uh, two different websites, visitannarbor.org, and then uh, what, is the, what is the preferred URL for our employee? Uh, that would be ipsyreal.com. Ipsyreal.com, yes. Yeah. So uh, businesses here, if it's travel related, are welcome to submit uh, the listing for free. Uh, our, our websites are visited by thousands of people each month looking for things to do and see. Uh, so just free exposure. Thank you, Chen. Um, See, so yeah, that was a great talk. We love that talk. It was fun. Right? Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, so glad to have Chen back. So, so next month, June 8th, mark your calendar. We have another cool guy. Yeah, you might know him. Shamir Ozeri is speaking on lean marketing. So he's come up with some interesting uh, strategies, how to maximize marketing value with limited resources. So who doesn't need that, right? I mean, we just bring in these smart people. I don't know where we find them. They dress nice, they come in here, and they teach us things that are brilliant. So uh, thanks to Chad. Come back next month. Make sure to do some good in the, in the process. We have one minute left, so I'm gonna be asked just for a minute. But make sure to do some good. You know, at LA 2 we like to help others, right? So you go out and you take all that you learn and you go help others and teach them, and, and then we also try and make money, right? We gotta make a little money. Um, anyways, we'll see you June 8th. Thanks for coming, you guys are great, and uh, see you next time, thanks.
the website. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you.